Hey there, Builder Blog. I'm turning this episode over to Andy Saro today, and we're going to go down to Norwalk and interview the Beetle King himself. That's right. You've seen Secrets of, of BattleBot Champions, but now let's go see a Secrets of video on the Norwalk Champion. special episode of the Scorpios Builder Vlog, this time with Calvin Eva. He is showing us maybe the best beetle weight of all time, Lynx. Yeah, so this is Lynx. Um, it's the two-time NHRL champion. Um, and yeah, it's beaten robots from you know England, Brazil, and all over the US, East Coast, West Coast. Um, so here is an inside look. All right, so it's a asymmetric egg beater. Um, I think what's unique about this is it actually has a tooth on the counterweight side, so it can bite no matter how much feed I get. If I get too much feed, then it still you know has a, a tooth sur surface to hit on. And then you can see this tooth is very worn, but this is the main impacting tooth. Um, I designed these special titanium um, fudgelets to kind of glide over the uh, all the Roughness in the wood floors uh, has a, a wider contact patch, so that helps keep it going. Um, real quick, if we could go back to the drum. Yeah. Why do people choose to use asymmetric drums? So, um, if you ever like machined anything or cut any like pieces of wood, what you want to do is you know provide constant steady pressure, um, so then you don't come out with any like jagged edges or like you know really nasty cuts but in combat robots we want to do the complete opposite so we want to feed as fast as possible which is why links is so fast and then we want as few teeth as possible so an asymmetric egg beater means that it only has one tooth so and then the other side is just a counterweight to keep it balanced so uh, to get the biggest hits and the most you know dramatic uh, uh, events we want a single two. So you're saying as so, basically the theory of cutting at like a saw versus having a huge bludgeoning impact. Exactly. Yeah, we want the bludgeoning impact because with these little robots, they only have three pounds behind them and not that much traction. So we can't really do constant pressure for a long period of time. Speaking of you going back to the wedgelets, it looks like you have a pretty interesting design on the front to uh, keep them mounted and rounded to the floor. Yeah, so, um, yeah, they're at a specific angle so that they look cool. That's the only reason for the angle. Uh, but they're mounted with TPU, uh, so they're very shock absorbing. And then going back to the speed thing, I created these titanium cleat wheels. So they're like track cleats. Um, you know, for people that race or run in the track, they actually bite into the wood and uh, give me more traction than, say, a rubber wheel. So this is very specific to the arena that you're playing. Yeah, I feel like that's a really fun aspect of Combat Robots is designing to the specific arena. So in SoCal, we have you know, steel floors, and so I'll run magnets and uh, hard rubber wheels. Um, and events that have pits, then I'll you know change my driving style to suit that arena. And then you know when I go to the East Coast or uh, or walk havoc, then I have a you know specific driving style and specific setup for that arena and for that event. And so you have another version over here. It looks like with the foam tires, for example. Yeah. So this is what I run at other events. Um, and then it has a wedge for uh, fighting horizontals. So you're able to be very modular with this design. Whether yeah. you're fighting different opponents, different arenas, you can switch to have the most optimal version of things at any time. Yep. But the main robot stays the same. It's all the same frame pieces. It's just the little front end pieces and wheels that I change. So it's, it's still the same base robot throughout. 
And then how did you go about machining this? So the frame, all the white pieces are UHMW. I machine it at home on my CNC router. Um, it's very pocketed out, so it's like it's actually kind of a larger robot, but it's very uh, very full of air, um, and that tends to be pretty good armor. Um, it looks yeah. like you have belt drive going through. Yep. So I have my drive motors in the middle here. You can actually take the bottom off. Oh, we get the inside look. Cover your eyes, children. So this is the inside, it's very compact. So I have my two drive motors. They're actually very big for a beetle weight, um, but since I like to run on steel floors with magnets, it takes a lot more drive power to run that. So I have large drive motors, large planetary gearboxes, and then belts going to the front and back. Um, when I run magnets, I'll actually run into scenarios where I actually like break a finger tech belt uh, just through the sheer torque of the motors. Um, and then for my weapon, I have a uh, prop drive 2836 um, and then a, a belt drive to the weapon. And what kind of power is that motor? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's about a 1,000 kV motor, um, but I run it on 6S, so 6 cells. With the implant? Yeah, my phone. And so what is the tip speed? Um, I think it's around 200 or something. It's not crazy high, but it's high enough. 200 miles an hour, how many RPMs would you say? Um, I think like 14,000 or something. And then uh, the weight of the beater bar? The weight of the egg beater is like 240 or 250 grams. Okay. So um, roughly half a pound, right? Yeah, roughly half a pound. So it's relatively light. Um, yeah, I know a lot of three-pound robots have much heavier weapons, uh, but since I have so much of the weight focused on the drivetrain, which is, I think, the most important part of the robot, then uh, weight comes out of the weapon. And then finishing off the armoring on top of yeah. this Yeah, so this is aluminum. Um, this is actually my heat sink for the speed controllers. So as the egg beater is spinning, then it blows air across it and keeps all my electronics cool. Wow. Yeah. And so, what made you settle on this design? Um, this seemed like a pretty good, uh, you know, competitive design. This is actually kind of the first design I came up with for a Beetleweight. It was my first Beetleweight robot, and I've just been iterating on, on it since. Um, so I wanted to kind of simplify the the chassis and have two rails, and then that meant having a wider weapon between the wheels. Um, yeah. When you design this robot, typically we see a lot of these drum spinners be very wide in nature, or have wide wheel bases. However, with Lynx, we have one that it's longer. Than the yeah, it's, it's very square. Um, and that's just how I package everything with the electronics. So I have a battery that goes back here, and then my drive motors, and then weapon motor, and then weapon. So it ends up just being a very square robot. Um, I didn't want the egg beater to be too wide, because then it gets a little bit more fragile. Yeah. Um, you have, when you hit something on a corner, then all that torsion goes through the entire weapon. And if you have a really wide weapon, then um, you have a lot of momentum on the other side of the, of the egg beater trying to break it apart. So if you keep it a little narrower, it keeps it a little stronger. So you've competed in how many events with this Um, let's see. Probably like a ball ball. 15, 15 or so. 15. Yeah. And how many have you won? 13. So you're, you're batting a pretty good yeah. record. Yeah. Okay. What robots have given you the most trouble? Um, definitely Droopy. Um, he's been a consistent, um, you know, breaker of links. So, uh, go back to the wedge robot that so this is a similar setup to what I use against Groupy. I have these really tall TPU just kind of bumpers and that's because of Droopy. He's very unique where instead of just you know hitting kind of in the middle of the robot like most kind of tombstone-esque robots or like a undercutter like Silent Spring, Droopy hits really high and really low because of the angle of the blade. So I have these bumpers up here to protect the robot a little bit better. So 
Yeah, Tommy has really pushed me to iterate and uh, improve links, which is really awesome, and it's been a lot of fun. Droopy making its way out of the corner. Links knocking Droopy up in the air. Full on aggressive, keeping Droopy back, and now Lynx is in the corner. Nice big hit from Lynx, sending Droopy up to the ceiling. Droopy trying to get back up to speed. Lynx doing everything he can to keep Droopy in that corner. He's not letting him get out. And there we go, that's Lynx's weapon. Beyond that, it looks like you also have another robot built to specifically counter Droopy in some sort of ways. Mixtape over here. Yeah, so mixtape is in pieces right now, but um, yeah, so that's my flamethrower robot mixtape. Um, it's basically just a big butane can on wheels. So I have the same drive motors as Lynx, just because I had spares. And then I have a servo that pushes the butane can against a custom uh, Venturi nozzle. And then I have an igniter here, which ignites the butane when it comes out. Um, and yeah, so I have to do a bunch of prototyping with the igniter. Um, you have to get the right air fuel mixture for it to ignite reliably. Um, but other than that, it's just a very simple, big wheeled robot. And it's just super simple and super fun and easy to repair. And, I just have a blast with this thing. And it looks like a lot of the same design principles run across from the next two weeks, right? Uh, some similar ones. I think it's very drive-centric because it's more of a control bot. So, um, yeah, more weight is contributed to the drivetrain. Um, but other than that, it uh, either has long forks or a big wedge. And you know, it's my for fun bot. It's not meant to be you know, competitive or particularly good. Um, it's just to have fun. And now with Lynx, what are some upcoming events that you're looking to go to? So I'm going to be at uh, the August Mohawk Havoc, and then um, hopefully finals later in the year, um, and then I might bring it out to some other Southern California events or other like championship like, level events. And uh, lastly, close thing is, uh, if you could attribute anything to Lynx's winning, what would you attribute yeah. it to? Um, just trial and error and making things better as you find issues with them. Um, you know, every, every fight and every event is a great place to learn more breaks um, and try to think of ways of how to improve it. And I think that's you know, one of the most fun parts about combat robots. Um, and then just collaborating with friends too. Like, uh, even though you know, Tommy and Droopy is kind of Lynx's nemesis, we'll get together and hang out and you know, think of ways to improve uh, Droopy and Lynx. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks for taking the time to show us Lynx. Hope everybody at home loves to see the inside of this robot too. This is what it takes to win tournaments. Now then, really appreciate it. Of course, thank you. Hey, Scorpio Spitter Blog. It's Diana. I just wanted to thank you all so much for the really generous birthday wishes. It meant a lot and it made my day a lot happier. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. On to the winner. So Yamagata BR, I really loved your comment about how the sparks would light up my day and it did. It did, it always does. Who doesn't love sparks? So anyway, thank you all again for your wonderful birthday wishes. I hope you all enjoy this week's video and have a wonderful day. And one more thing, Calvin, you wanted to show us on this robot? Yeah, so I designed my own pre-charge switch. So as I screw in the screw, it activates a pre-charge circuit. So it slowly charges up the capacitors and then uh, fully turns on the robot. So and the reason I have this is because I'm running 6S, or which is relatively high voltage, uh, and it tends to spark and erode the switch. Awesome.